Hello and welcome again to another edition of 5 Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with is Judy Perez. So Judy, can we start off by having you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, hi. Um, I uh, currently run a nonprofit organization in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we offer educational services in the area of um, support and resources for blended learning implementation, um, usually on a district-wide scale, uh, and uh, focusing on um, guidance and support through consulting, teacher training, and uh, an OER, Open Education Repository of Digital Courses. That came from my experience in education. I've been in education for 30 years, um, starting in uh, as a science teacher at the secondary level, predominantly middle school, and then uh, kind of fell into online education. Um, not really seeking to go into that, but uh, it, when it first uh, kind of started to take hold, we were um, in, a, in a school district that uh, started one of the first online uh, schools in Colorado, and that was through K-12, Colorado Virtual Academy. We were one of the two first K-12 online schools that were established. And since then, I had been an online school director, principal, uh, building out that school, eventually went to Jeffco Public Schools, a school district of 85,000 students, where I was uh, the director of e-learning and working on implementation of blended learning at scale. And then also at the same time, at that time simultaneously, the principal of their online school. And uh, he was uh, leading online schools for about 13 years and uh, then uh, went to the Colorado Department of Education for the Charter School Institute for a year and then was approached uh, by a couple of local foundations asking if I would start this nonprofit I Learn Collaborative. So we've been in existence for about seven years. All right. So over the years, you've worn a number of hats as a school leader in both the brick and mortar and the online environment. And obviously this school year, we've had sort of a major disruption to it, one that came about quite abruptly. What advice would you give to school leaders on how they can accommodate that disruption as they finish out this school year and begin to plan to open up the next school year? Well, I would say, first of all, don't expect the same that you would have if it was a regular year. And I'm sure I'm, that's uh, probably obvious, but students that are doing full-time education, especially if there has been little preparation or training, may disengage. Uh, you know, it's not the ideal situation to have a student interacting with a screen to um, access their learning and their instruction. Um, that serves a small percentage of the student population, in my opinion, who may have uh, different needs, and that's why they're engaging in full-time online education. Uh, the students will do what they can, and also for the teachers, again, they're in survival mode. This is a triage period, and so we know that the the highest needs are feeding the students, possibly their families, uh, ensuring that they have access to a Wi-Fi and some device. And so if you are uh, meeting those needs, you've succeeded in what needed to be done at the end of the school year. They're, they missed maybe a couple of months of learning. I know that's quite a bit, but that can be made up over the longer term. There are ways and opportunities that I'm seeing in Colorado and other states where uh, there will be more access to student learning um, over the summer. Uh, local foundations are working with local organizations um, and uh, providing opportunities for students to have some learning over the summer, as well as teacher training. Uh, we are actually um, very high demand with the teacher training over the summer. So uh, teachers um, and educators are basically planning for some sort of a blended learning environment coming in the fall. 
So lots of preparation um, is, is being planned over the summer. And uh, in the fall, uh, what might be something to think about would be, would there be an opportunity for onboarding students kind of into this blended or online uh, environment? And can you do that for maybe the first two weeks of school or the first week of school? This has been a practice that we've been doing in online education for 20 years. And onboarding is really just kind of that hand-holding uh, uh, of the uh, relationship between the teacher and the students and uh, kind of walking them through what are the essential um, objectives that they need to understand to become more relaxed and maybe um, have some small successes as they get used to being in a virtual environment. Uh, another thing to consider is maybe taking some of the previous year's units and lessons with teachers and creating um, what we call uh, the uh, basically the bottom line pathways uh, and uh, not having to try to reteach everything from the last year, but we call them critical paths. Taking a critical path from the last two months of that school year and, and using those to kind of make up for the previous year and maybe the first month of school. And, and if you ease students into this environment, um, there won't be this maybe sense of, oh my gosh, you know, I, I've got to do this, this, and that. So if you set those expectations at the beginning, that will allow for maybe a less, um, less volatile or, or maybe um, stressful beginning of the new year. Okay. Now you, you mentioned that sort of that, that volatility and that, you know, oh, you know, oh my gosh, I've got to get this done kind of thing that we went through with teachers this time around. One of the things that we do know about pandemics is that they often come in waves. And um, so there is a chance that there will be disruptions to the next school year um, because of this. And so what can school leaders start planning out both now and as they uh, progress through the early parts of the, the new school year to prepare for a more seamless transition if a complete shutdown of, you know, their individual district or, you know, maybe an entire state does actually happen? Well, uh, the good news is the worst is behind us. For everyone who went into face-to-face -to, -face to online, that learning curve is basically a line like this. It's just straight up. So you've been through the worst of it. Um, when I started in online education, um, I had been in education as a teacher and principal for 13 years, and I thought, I can do this. And my learning curve was almost straight up. So getting beyond um, kind of that triage mode and, and trying to figure out uh, who needs uh, more access to Wi-Fi, if you've worked out those issues and you've worked out the issues of making sure every student has a device, then um, the rest will be a little bit easier, to be honest. Um, you know, in Colorado, we have our share of snow days and, uh, you know, that could usually it's one or two days, but we've had it um, in the past where, you know, school was out for maybe three, four or five days. Um, we have worked with districts in um, supporting teachers and training so that in the future, snow days would just mean that you're basically a turnkey moving into an online situation. And we've had districts saying, hey, you know, because of the teacher training that we've received, our teachers were more prepared to transition into an online environment, which was kind of our, our plan uh, this year because of the snow days and not taking away from, you know, the days of attendance that, you know, that the state requires and so on. So I would say continue to, to prepare as though that is the inevitable. Teacher training is probably, uh, you know, third on the list of um, after making sure that students are, are uh, you know, equipped with the Wi-Fi access and the devices. Uh, if teachers are able to access resources and, um, and utilize some form of blended learning in, in, you know, when they go back, blended 
really does transition into online almost seamlessly. And if you have that plan of what blended, um, you know, a blended program from, from the first day on, that transition into online education will almost feel like turnkey. Now, I know it's easier said than done. I've got 20 years behind my belt in online and blended learning. But, but truly, I think that teacher preparedness is key. Uh, I also believe that making sure you have the digital resources, um, you know, in the form of supplemental um, uh, content, as well as, you know, some substantial um, uh, lessons or maybe uh, lesson plans that have been digitized on a platform. Even Google Classroom does really great. If you have teachers practicing that, um, you know, well before maybe another, you know, uh, episode maybe in your area, teachers will feel much more comfortable. What I've always told teachers who were new into online education when I was a principal at an online school was it's going to feel maybe painful for a year. Once you get a year under your belt, even six months, you're going to feel like, oh, I've got this, you know, because you've been through the worst of it. And, and each day is a new day. Each lesson you teach is a new, new lesson. But know that for every lesson you get behind your belt, it's going to get easier and easier. And, um, I, you know, most online teachers at the beginning are in the same, were in the same boat as our teachers that had to turn into online teachers, you know, in a day. But onboarding will be really important, not just for the students, but for the teachers as well. New teachers, make sure that when you have any kind of an induction program that you include some blended learning training in there because this is truly the future of where we're heading in education, pandemic or not. All right, perfect. Well, thank you very much, Judy. So this has been another edition of 5 Minutes on K-12 Online Learning With, and today our with has been Judy Perez. Thank you. Thank you.